Welcome everyone. We've got a nice group here tonight. Today's topic is all about correlations. Gain market intelligence with intermarket relationships. I'm going to be using two different presentations. But before we get started, most of you in the room today were, or in the room now, were in the trading room this morning. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the cross box. But first, let's go over a few questions. Do you feel you're missing a special ingredient in your trading? Have you been blindsided in some of your trading after entering a clear trade signal? And have you gotten stuck in a choppy trading environment? Well, if you are a day trader, a swing trader, momentum trader, a mean reversion trader, as long as you're an active trader in either stocks, Forex, or futures market, then what I'm going to share with you today is going to be important. Today's agenda is to teach you the most important intermarket relationships in today's markets, how to spot institutional activity using cross market techniques. After all, we do want to trade on the side of the institutions and how to stay steps ahead of price action in some of the most popular markets. Little about me. I semi retired last De uh, December 2019 as a uh, CTA. That means I manage money professionally. I've been uh, recognized in the industry as an innovator of strategy and systems development. I've uh, received numerous awards from some of the large institutions, including Franklin, Templeton Group and Oppenheimer funds. I developed the first auto execution software with over 20 institutional dealing desk and clearing firms. First auto execution system incorporating correlation analytics and the first market sentiment indicator. I've also uh, received the uh, Trade Titan Award, or I think it's eight years running, including uh, this last year. Uh, that's uh, only been given to the top 1%. This is not a get rich quick scheme. Uh, some of the house rules also includes if you're an educator looking for new material, you're not going to be able to do it. So best you move on. You got to understand there's risk involved in trading, including Forex trading stocks trading, futures trading, and so forth. If you're looking for the holy grail, it doesn't exist. You can go ahead and move on. You gotta understand not everyone will be successful. And sometimes, and I've been doing this by the way for 30 years, professionally for 30 years. And uh, sometimes the people I think are gonna be the best are not. And, Sometimes the ones that I think don't have a chance become some of the best and most successful and consistent traders. So you, 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 can't, you can't really judge. All right. This course is not going to be about recognizing or uh, patterns, technical patterns in the markets like double tops, double bottoms, and so forth. It's going to be strictly about correlations, intermarket relationships. But if you're trained in it, you'll be able to spot it. Just like you can spot, for those that follow technical analysis, you can spot a double top, a double bottom, you know, et cetera. You'll be able to. Now, Question, can you identify there's an arrow in a baker's measuring cup in the FedEx logo? Logo. Can you identify it? Okay. 
Thanks, Dwayne. <laughs> I spent, uh, I've been, by the way, for going back to that picture of me on that sailboat, I've been in uh, the Caribbean, West Indies, mostly going back and forth to uh, South Florida and the West, mostly in the West Indies uh, for the last year and a half. So some of you can spot the uh, the arrow in the uh, measuring cup. All right, here's here's the point on this exercise. Once you spot it, it'll never go away. I I've had students, traders that I've taught that have sent me emails. You know, every time a FedEx truck drives by, I, you know, my eyes go directly to the to the arrow and the measuring cup. I'm going to go ahead and draw it for you. Here's the arrow. And here's the measuring cup. So now you've been cursed. Now every time you, you uh, see a truck drive by, your eyes are going to go there. And that's a good thing. And that's what technical uh, charting patterns is all about. And when, you're, when you become trained in intermarket correlations, when you start seeing these movements, different asset classes, they're patterns. And you'll be able to say, oh, this is what's going on. All right, give me a minute to get rid of this. And now I'm going to jump over to the cross box. And for those that were in the room this yesterday and this morning, you heard this. Um, yesterday morning before the market opened, we had a, a bullish ranking. Uh, as a as a bullish breakout, and it gets an extra number for the ranking, and that's what pushed it to bullish four. Okay, it was the pattern bullish breakout and the resistance on the Nasdaq, and here's the price trigger, and this cross box. You know, we we do all the different asset classes, trend analysis, and so forth. So let's see what happened and let's see how this works. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is not to show off the cross box. Uh, in fact, we hadn't really even talked about the cross box until this week um, for in the trading room. Uh, cross box is used by uh, a lot of our members, whether they're swing trading, position trading, or, or uh, day trading. For day trading, it serves them as a great tool to use to identify uh, or or at least select the markets they you know they're interested in trading so if I may here is the s p and you can see the bullish breakout let me get a drawing tool to show it to you here was the bullish breakout. Oh, wrong color pen. Here was the, the bullish breakout and sure enough, you know, that was pre-market. That was during the London session. Our market open, if I remember correctly, and bam, straight down. But, you know, the ranking stayed. It, it, nothing had changed in the ranking. And then look what it did today. Straight up. Even hit second resistance. So, 
patterns work most of the time, like everything else doesn't work 100% of the time. But if you're able to identify patterns like this, and you combine that with intermarket relationships and the correlations, understanding how the markets work and what the institutions are doing, I'm gonna show you that tonight, then you have a lot more, what's the old saying, uh, arrows in your quiver? You just got a lot more ammunition to tilt you know, more odds in your favor. And trading is about that. Now we're going to move on to the material. This is from one, I do a uh, master trader series. It's a, it's a series of courses. Um, and so this is from one segment of it. Welcome to an entirely new dimension of analysis and trading for the global financial markets. Most traders rely on a single market approach to trading. For example, stock traders do not really pay attention to what's happening in the commodity market, and commodity traders do not pay much attention to what is happening in the bond market or the currency market. The single market approach fails most traders since all financial markets are related to each other. Multi-asset traders study different markets as part of their analysis. Macroeconomic investors utilize more than one financial market as part of their analysis approach. Intermarket relationships and correlations is one of the most important aspects of macroeconomic investing. Most large institutional firms use macroeconomic strategies as their main theme for investment policy. Understanding how different asset classes interact with each other can significantly help individual traders regardless of markets they trade or their style of trading. You will discover that identifying where the large institutional firms are initiating or unwinding positions in the financial markets can be very profitable for the astute trader. Positive feedback. This is I hope you really grasp this. This is really important. Forecasting price movement in the financial markets has been attempted for centuries by different disciplines, ranging from fundamental analysis to technical analysis. Today, it is at the forefront for all market participants, regardless if you are an individual trader operating from your home office or you work for a Wall Street financial institution as an economist, strategist, or just simply on the trade desk. Everyone is eager to know where prices are heading next, despite their individual approach. As a quant trader, you need to build and follow your own forecasting model. Macro traders are known to forecast interest rate yield changes from different countries in order to commit directional positions in one or multiple asset classes. Stock traders tend to focus more on future corporate earnings. No matter if you're a stock, bond, commodity, or currency trader, you're going to be racing against time. It is common knowledge that professionals from the financial markets attempt to anticipate future changes that could have an impact on the markets. Their models often include data mining, ranging from central bank policies, new legislation, economic expansion, or contraction, just to name a few. And, the, and what's, going, what's been going on with the pandemic as far as economic and the markets, it's all about that. Oh my gosh, you know, uh, lockdown, isolation, uh, uh, it's going to rain havoc on being able to forecast with some of these companies, especially the airlines, the, the cruise ships, what they're gonna be able to meet earnings. So you get stampede, you get, another market dynamic that we're going to cover as well in this training segment you will have the opportunity to view the financial markets from a different perspective 
physics, meteorology, and the natural sciences can teach us an unusual but logical approach. Sorry, folks, I had something popped up on my screen. Uh, physics, meteorology, and the natural sciences can teach us an unusual but logical approach to forecasting price action in the financial markets. As the physicist and author Mark Buchanan wrote in his book, Forecast, and it's a great book, each year in spring and early summer, warm, moist air sweeping in from the Gulf of Mexico slips under sheets of colder air tumbling in over the Rockies. Warm air rises. That banal phrase of folk physics, here it takes on life, gravity drives vast plumes of the warmer, lighter air to penetrate the colder layer above the billow upward to a height of 10 miles. This is the first ingredient in a recipe for violence, weather violence. The second is surface winds blowing to the north and from the west, which drive this into a tornado with several billion tons of wet, warm air whipping into an unstable spinning power, creating near perfect conditions for powerful tornadoes, some as much as a mile in diameter with winds churning to 400 miles per hour. To some of us, tornadoes seem freakish, unnatural, and definitely abnormal, yet the state of Kansas alone sees hundreds of them every year, and they come about through perfectly ordinary atmospheric processes. But broadly speaking, it is all just part of what happens in the atmosphere. One event builds on another and then another, and soon an ordinary gray sky becomes a violent, memorable twister. More technically, we could say the atmosphere is prone to what scientists call positive feedback, the consequences of which our human minds find hard to imagine. Using positive feedbacks to pre predict shifts in market sentiment, as well as near future price activity in the financial markets is at the core of my forecasting model. Having a good understanding of how the financial markets really work and the implication of correlations between the different asset classes can provide you with predictive values similar to the formation or processes of a tornado as presented in, in the uh, previous illustration. Positive feedback is nothing more than the process by which small variations in a given system can become increasingly large. As a trader, think of it as a stop loss at a key level in the market, being triggered and then followed by more selling and again triggering another series of stop loss orders resulting in an intensified and steep sell-off. And a lot of times it's due to at one level, computers. It could start by humans, then computers, and then com and then more computers, and then all of a sudden you get a domino effect. To be simplistic, positive feedback can be described as when A produces B, which in turn produces even more A, driving a chain of events, which in turn has the power to push market sentiment and prices to extremes. All right, we're going to get down to the meat of it. As part of the uh, course in the previous chapter, which we're not covering today, we talked about we talked normally about how the financial markets really work and how the different stages of the business cycle can push and pull the various asset classes in different directions. We also talk about how the financial market, especially the stock market, is a leading economic indicator. Stocks typically peak and trough ahead of the economy. The recession that followed the housing collapse in 2007 occurred three months after stocks peaked and ended in 2009, three months after stocks bottomed. The relationships between the different markets can be very visual when looking at the price charts with the right markets. Intermarket relationships have become popular among macro traders and investors alike. Think about what's going on right now. We had the market sell off due to the virus and the implications that it could 
due to earnings and uh, businesses, companies, um, and the economy. Well, we're kind of in the middle of it, right? Why is the market up so much? People are scratching their heads. You know, we were down, what was it, 35%? How much are we down now? Maybe 10? We've made a tremendous comeback. How can that be? Companies are still, you know, they're expecting a bunch of uh, bankruptcies. Because the market is looking six to eight months later. That's one of the reasons. Any questions, by the way, before I move on? All right, then we'll move on. Once you're trained in pattern recognition, which most of you are, uh, by the way, I will be doing a course in the near future on pattern recognition. You'll be able to quickly spot shifts in market sentiment, which in essence is the result of rotation flow sparked by relationships between the stocks, bond, currency, and commodity markets. At the end of this chapter, you will have exercises to help you think better and trade smarter, tying in techniques from pattern recognition methods with a deeper understanding of why the market's behavior is always changing. So you'll be able to recognize after tonight, hopefully, pattern recognition as far as correlations. But chart pattern recognition, price action, I'm, I will cover it in another workshop. And I'm also going to do another workshop, a third workshop, on how the markets really work, the business cycle, and so forth. Vince, I think you attended one of those workshops when the office was on Miracle Mile and Lejeune in, nine, in the late 1990s. Am I right? It's the same course. Yeah, the trading, the physical trading room. You're right. It's the same course. Nothing's really changed. That course, interestingly enough, and I've been quoted, I called the top in the tech bubble in New York doing a presentation for Omega Research. I was a guest speaker. I was practically booed out of there. And it happened six months later. Vince, you still have the books? Awesome. Then in uh, 2007, actually in some resort in Mexico, it was, it was like $20,000 per person for the week. I was a guest speaker among others, and there were a lot of real estate people there, and I called for a, uh, a strong pullback in all risk assets, including real estate, because it covers all the different major asset classes. Again, I was practically booed out of there. But I, uh, but it's 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 all in writing. It was filmed, and I had a lot a lot of people calling me uh, eight months at, later. And it's not that I had a magic, you know, wonder ball or cards or, or anything. I was just following the the, um, the 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 model. It's a model that I've used for 30 years, and uh, it's it's really really good. And so I will be teaching that at a later date. But tonight's material is key. So when you're able to apply positive feedback tactics, you will be able to anticipate shifts in market sentiment, resulting at times in momentum that can provide trading opportunities. All right, so this part was rotation flows. At Cassie, you're 100% right. We have a indicator uh, called um, Architect, where we have all the major asset classes, and we've got indicators built in it, like the next streams. 
that show us velocity on the different asset classes that help us identify the rotation flows. Yeah, Cassie was in one of, one of our workshops in 2012. And I covered that there as well. All right, sentiment and crowd behavior. Crowd behavior can be seen as the prevailing attitude of market participants anticipating price development in the markets. Market sentiment is referred to as the tone of the market as it is revealed through the activity and price movements of different asset classes. One of the most popular and common rotation flows influenced by market sentiment is the risk on risk off trade, which gained focus following the financial crisis of 2008. However, as Vince will tell you, Vince, remember back in the late 90s, we used to use the uh, S&P and the bond markets. And we were most successful trading the first hour and the last hour. Uh, and it was due to, to uh, those two correlations. Vince says he's still doing it now. All right, what is risk on and risk off? Now it's it's known, but you know, 20, 30 years ago, nobody was talking about it. 10 years ago, nobody was talking about it. Maybe in some circles, uh, you've been hearing it in the last five years. The effect of the risk on risk off trade is greater volatility, which is what we're looking for, and greater asset correlation. The huge movement of large institutions and investors all in or all out of asset classes has caused many assets to become highly correlated. Correlations is the mathematical representation of how closely different asset prices move together in lockstep. During a risk on trading environment, market participants will sell safer haven assets such as government bonds, cash, or low interest bearing assets and buy riskier assets with the potential for greater returns. Conversely, during risk off market participants sell riskier assets and buy safer haven, and that's supposed to be buy, not BY, BY, BUY, and buy safer haven assets such as bonds and cash. Risk on and risk off sentiment has been widely accepted by the professional trading community since 2011. Ah, nine years now, 10 years. UBS, AG, and Swiss Global Financial Services Company launched two unique ETNs. I won't bore you with that, but this is the what they weighed in. Energy is 48%, equities is 46 currency is 28 foreign currencies. Um, agriculture has a small part, bonds nothing, it's just the opposite with the uh with the risk off the stock and bond markets tend to compete for investors funds investors monies there are certain periods of time when stocks and bonds trade in the same direction and other times when they trade in opposite directions the astute trader needs to keep pace with changing market sentiment and the main drivers behind the shifts that take place as we go from one business stage to the next during the business cycle during March of 2013, there was a shift in focus involving the currency and bond markets. The near zero interest rate environment in the U.S. that began in 2008 began to change. It was market driven, not a change of Fed policy. The interest rate yield on the U.S. Treasury 10 year note began to rally. The currency market took notice and began rotating from foreign currencies into the U.S. dollar, and that has been continuing. Also, the U.S. dollar is a safe haven asset. And when you have political or geopolitical risk, you also see the dollar rise. Now, with the pandemic, they sold all assets and they went into cash, U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar rallied strong and all assets were sold. And then eventually that started to unwind. Money has started to come out of cash as seen in the US dollar. It's been going back into 
bonds and stocks and some of the commodities like gold. Uh, and I've been talking about it every morning when I open up the trading room, right? So it's important to know the concepts, but it's also important to put it into practice to what's going on in the market at any given time. We had not seen this environment for as long as I've been in the business. I never, I don't remember seeing it. The, the, um, Long-term capital bust was different. The Russian ruble was uh, collapse was different. The dot com was different. Um, Two thousand eight was different than this one. Two thousand eight we had systemic risk. Here we didn't. It was all about something new, something unknown, and no visibility in earnings. Right. Uh, but the dynamics have not changed. The reason and the cause, I mean, there's and there's slight variations, but it's all the same. Now we've been seeing for weeks now, money slowly coming out of cash. Oh, by the way, there's a time where we have seen where money comes into the dollar, the bonds, and U.S. stocks, and that's capital inflows. Sometimes just capital outflows. So there's a whole series. But if you guys continue to come into the trading room, I cover it in the morning. Now, for those that have not been trained in this, that's eh, just music. You know, may not mean much. But after tonight's going to hopefully it'll begin to mean something to you and you'll be able to put it. You'll be able to uh, take it, the concepts, put it into practice and have a better understanding how these financial markets really work. And it will help you, again, to identify asset classes that are ready for aggressive price action, keep you out of choppy markets, and allow you to trade with confidence, not feel like you're in the dark. So in theory, basically, risk on is when there's a move out of bonds into stocks. As since 2008, as interest rate came down and down and down and down and down, there was there's been really only one trade. You know, long stock, long risk assets and short risk assets. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the that's the risk on risk off concept a very long time ago before 2008 you uh you know there were there were there were more trades it wasn't just you know all in all out but as the macroeconomic type funds have gotten huge that's their main style of trading so now you've got this huge amount of money out there and they're on the same trade we also found this out uh, in 2008 when a lot of these funds, they, they didn't blow up, but they were, you know, they, they had this privacy on some of these funds that just wouldn't tell anybody what they were doing. And we came to find out that all these funds that had done so great from the last recession in 2000 to 2007, 2008, uh, they were all down the same amount. Some were down, you know, between 40 and 60 percent during the uh, the crisis. The uh, mortgage-backed security uh, breakdown. So a lot of these guys all in or all out. Now the carry trade. This is one of the best kept secrets in the financial markets. And I, it's just, it just amazes me how nobody really talks about this. This is key. And, and it's in the architect, so you can, you can follow it. You don't have, to, that's the other thing. We have indicators that tell you when it's risk on, 
risk off, when there's conflict in the market, which means stay out, when the markets are mixed, there's no clarity. We also have an indicator that tells you when the carry trade is on. The carry trade is a strategy, strategy in which an investor borrows money at a low interest rate in order to invest in an asset that is likely to provide a higher return. Now, I'm very familiar with this strategy because back in 2002, I believe is when we started it, uh, 2002, 2003, it, around that time, I was part of a team that had structured an investment vehicle. It was complicated, but I'll give you the, the basics of it. Um, the client, first of all, it was only corporate clients. This smallest account was 10 million. And what we would do is borrow in Japanese yen. At that time, that was the lowest yielding interest rate, which was when we started, I believe it was a quarter of a percent, then eventually went up to half of a percent. We would take those funds and reinvest it in U.S. treasuries that was yielding 5%. So uh, it was leveraged. Most of the time, we, uh, the, uh, what, what, what they would do is put those bonds as collateral. So the actual amount of money on a $30 million transaction, they would only put up like 3 or $4 million. So what happens is that it's being financed, right? And you, you borrow, it's done in Japan. That's where it starts. So you're borrowing in a, like a credit Swiss with an office or a bank in Japan. You do it in um, local currency, Japanese yen. Then you got to convert it into dollars, which then you have to buy the bonds, right? Well, that trade doesn't really exist anymore because all, you know, after 2008, a lot of the rates went down. So where'd they go? They went to stocks, especially the S&P 500. So what happens is they'll borrow 30 million, 100 million, 200 million. They buy stocks. They put up very little money. They buy stocks. And if stocks drop, they're going to get a margin call. So they got to sell more stocks to meet the margin call. Well, you know, it starts snowballing, right? And just the opposite, by the way, when they start putting on these positions, they're not small positions, they're large. So what we do, especially me, my style of trading, I look at that. And if I'm seeing that, oh my goodness, the carry trade is on, then, and I'm getting long signals in stocks, I'm paying attention. I'm looking for my entry. Okay. Now, lately, we haven't seen too much of that trade occurring. And that's because a lot of these institutions have been in cash. But there's going to get a, it's going to uh, get to a, a place where they're going to start they're going to have all their monies in play and send it so they're going to go out and they're going to leverage and this is how they leverage if the market is up 12 percent, as an example well these funds don't want to be up 12 percent. they want to be up 16 percent. they want to be up 20 percent. and this is one way that they do it they're leveraging they're borrowing and they're they're leveraging so it's a great area to pay attention to in the markets because also when the, when the unwinding begins, you got some great short opportunities. Again, keep coming into the trading room. I'll, I'll alert you of, of, um, of these dynamics. So the S&P 500 has been a favorable asset since the U.S. Federal Reserve policy shifted to stimulate the economy very early during the financial crisis. Big institutional players are known to take advantage of the interest rate differential between countries. They also apply very large leverage, 100 and 300 to 1. This causes important moves in the financial markets made possible by the trillions of dollars of central bank money creation. Here's an example of how the K 
carry trade works, hedge funds and other big players borrow the Japanese yen at a very low interest rate, very close to zero. Japanese yen are converted to dollars, U.S. dollars, which are invested in other markets with a potentially higher rate of return, such as the S&P 500. Emerging markets have benefited from this strategy as well. That's why early on, the emerging markets can be also a leading indicator on the way up and on the way down. They have benefited from this strategy as well as part of the structure, the lender requires the borrower to use collateral, which is usually assets being purchased with the loan proceeds. Unwinding occurs when the assets that were purchased decline in price. I already reviewed that with you. The crowded trade effect, another big thing to know. Crowded trades occur when a trade theme has attracted an unusual large number of participants, such as hedge funds or large institutional firms. As the trade theme becomes more and more popular, it attracts more capital inflows and positions to begin to become vulnerable to risk of high volatility. For the past several years, we have seen several crowded trade unravel, including the tech bubble, real estate bubble, two stock market crashes, and a full-blown financial crisis. Look at the Trump trade, right? Um, election night, when it looked like Trump was going to win, the S&P futures took off expectation that was expectation of um rollback of regulation just several things so they were already you know and that was a trade theme and that has been a trade theme until you know we just got what we got but i remember um after the election uh market just kept rolling up and then we start getting some volatility some pullbacks <clears throat> institutions trying to get out i, I don't remember the the, the uh, exact um, reasons right now but the crowded trade effect it's like being in a movie theater and somebody yelling fire everybody's heading towards the exit it's you know, it's it's just um, hard to explain, but when you see it, you'll know it. All right, bonds and gold. These are now the actual correlations in, in some of the asset classes. Gold has been demonstrating direct correlation with bonds and inverse correlation with interest rates. At times, gold has a fear premium factored in not necessarily an inflation premium here here's what drives that message in the past when u.s treasury yields were at five percent and the real yield was at 260 the price of gold is 471. when rates went to one prices hit their highest okay so there's a direct correlation in other words think of it this way if they're going to pay you three or four percent to be in a in a risk off asset, why would you want to hold gold? But if you are hardly getting any money for your bonds, gold starts to look attractive. I'm not going to go through the. Uh, the action items, because we're, we're quickly running out of time. Bonds, gold, Swiss franc, and the U.S. dollar. 25% of Switzerland's reserves are backed by gold. As U.S. bond yields drop, the U.S. dollar falls, and gold prices move up. The Swiss franc should also rise. There's the correlation. Well, here's a quick one. Tight correlations would suggest if bonds rise, then interest rate yields will fall. Gold should then rise, and the U.S. Dollars should what? Fall while the Swiss franc rises. All right, let's move on to bond, bonds, gold, and the commodity currencies. Australia is the third largest gold producer in the world, and Canada is the fifth largest producer. New Zealand is also a large producer of gold. So bonds go up, interest rate yields go down, gold should go up, Australian, Canadian, New Zealand dollars should go up and the U.S. dollar should come down. 
bonds, crude oil, and the Canadian dollar. Historically, there's been a consistent correlation between oil prices in the U.S. and the U.S. dollar. When the U.S. dollar strengthens, oil prices should fall and vice versa. Canada is one of the top oil producers in the world. So a lot of times it trades in the same direction with crude oil. Now, keep in mind, because of the pandemic, what's going on? I mean, there's been havoc in crude oil, right, in the energy market, especially crude oil. So you you know these are these are rare times, um, but under normal circumstances you'll see those two trade together. Bonds, one of the most misunderstood markets, but it's the financial gorilla. The bond market is one of the most powerful, influential markets that make up the global financial system. All the big players, including central banks, institutional investors, large corporations and especially macroeconomic investors pay close attention to the bond market. Interest rates are probably one of the key elements and at the core of economic and business cycles. At the beginning of the Clinton administration in the early 1990s, advisor James Carville was stunned at the power the bond market had over the government. In an interview, they asked him something related to um, forget what I forget the exact question, but they asked him that if he could come back, how would he come back? He said he used to think if there was reincarnation, he wanted to come back as the president or the pope. Then he thought maybe a uh, baseball hitter with a with a point four hundred average. But that now he wanted to come back as the bond market. He says you can intimidate anybody. At the cornerstone of our inner market correlations framework, we use the bond market as a starting point. All right, folks, we've pretty much covered most. Um, I will be what I'll be doing because our time is up. Want to leave it open for a couple questions. Um, the stuff that's left left is the gold drivers, uh, the U.S. dollar, geopolitics, and so forth, crude oil drivers. Um, I'm going to, and copper drivers, I'm going to cover these things uh, in the next, uh, what do we have? We have Thursday and Friday. So between th tomorrow and Friday, I'll cover these in the trading room in the morning before EP arrives. Any questions? Yeah, Jim. Let me see if I can go back to that slide. Yeah, I got to reconnect to the server. Give me one minute. And I'll, I'll pull the chart up. It'll make it easier to explain. Also, I do have, I think it's in, uh, I think it was in this, in this um, PowerPoint. Yeah. All right. So here, here's, here's what Jim was asking for, actually. Um, here is, this is a while back, but it still applies. This is the S&P 500 in white. These are U.S. bonds. You can see the shifts, right? You can see bonds going down while stocks go up. Stocks go down, bonds go up. Now, here's something interesting. They don't always go opposite. Sometimes they go together. There's different reasons for that. But you can see uh, here bonds are going up and stocks are going down. But here as, as S&P goes up, bonds are also going up and here as well. So you got to know when this is happening, and there's a couple other another market to look at to kind of figure it out. But when this is easy, 
because these are institutions jump, you know, getting out of one thing, going into the other. In this particular case in here, it's a uh, risk off. Um, this here is more capital inflows. And the next market to look at is the US dollar for this. So if the US dollar is also moving up, then, hey, it's cool. Jump on stocks. It's going to be fun. But when they're not, when the dollar, like in this case right here, if I remember correctly, the dollar was not, it, it's tough. It's choppy. So you want to, you want to be, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be trading, or at least you don't want to trade heavy, maybe light. Here is two risk on asset classes. And then, of course, they decoupled here. And that was um, go, uh, crude is also is not only going to be a market sentiment or moved by market sentiment like risk on risk off, but it's also going to move by, you know, inventories and things that are going on in the Middle East. But look, this is this is no coincidence. So imagine if you know this information and you've been seeing that crude oil. Of course, not lately, but at times it'll do this. It'll be moving ahead. You know, like look at here, it moved ahead of, of the S&P. Imagine buying the S&P, taking S&P for this ride. So you could use, I definitely do. I use uh, sometimes different markets as a leading indicator. I used one, uh, was it Monday or, or yesterday? I can't remember. I pointed one out some day this week. You know, my uh, what I'll have is uh, this will be taped. This is being recorded, rather. Uh, yes, Flam. This will be um, for those that registered. This this presentation will go out. Copper is part of the risk on assets. So here you can see the correlation between type correlation between copper and crude oil. Of course, again, this was they decoupled due to probably something happening in the Middle East or inventories. Can you see how powerful knowing this can be? Can you imagine looking at the one market, like in this case, you're looking at crude and you see crude form the bottom and going long. Do you, do you, do you, see, the, do you see the time difference in that? All right, this is the uh, carry trade. Here's the S&P going up. Here in green are the notes going down and the Japanese yen going down. That is the carry trade. You see that happening? Buy, buy, buy long stocks. The only thing to consider here is Am I going to go long S&P, the Dow, or the NASDAQ? And, of course, for that, we have the architect that gives us the leaders and laggards. Like right now, NASDAQ's leading uh, the Dow and the S&P during the uh, Asian session. Let's see. What time is it? Nine o'clock? Yeah, it's kind of. Since the open of the of the uh, Asian session. It's actually been the. Uh,
S&P, Dow, and NASDAQ. Take it back. Let me make sure I did that right. Yeah. All righty. More questions. You're welcome. You're welcome, members. Clem is asking, do you have a list of books or resources you can suggest for further education or reading? Yeah, there's there's a few. Um, Murphy has a pretty good book that he put out, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. He's put two or three of them out about intermarket correlations. He's a technician. Um, Buchanan put out the book forecast. But a lot of these, a lot of these are, um, you know, concepts and theories. And they don't really talk to you about uh, indicators and, and stuff to figure it out. They just tell you how, how they, how they're correlated. Uh, we teach you how it's correlated, then we give you the uh, indicators and the technology that helps you identify it. For example, here on this chart, this down here is the dynamic market sentiment indicator, the risk on, risk off. So uh, green is risk on, red is risk off. Blue and yellow is conflict and mixed. And to further explain that, see this red? That's this. See this green? That's this. See this area right here? That's this. This to this, if I'm doing it right, that's that. And then here we had bullish conflict. If you were in the room today, that's because money came in into st uh, stocks and bonds. No, wait, the end, the end is not true. Is that green? No, yeah, yeah, that is, that is. Um, you look back here, you see all this green. Look at that run up. This here is this. It works, guys. It works. Been doing this for 30 years. It's one of the best kept techniques and method methodology available today. And I don't know anybody else that's teaching it. So this architect gives you, if it's risk on or risk off, if the carry trade is on, if there's a forex play, in you know happening or not, and the the DMS. Let's see, there's a couple more coming in. Questions. Yeah, Mike, great question. Mike is saying, when looking at the market analyzer, which is the architect, leaders and laggers, how much energy should you put into the extreme numbers? They are fractions and whole numbers and sometimes are very small, uh, while other times relatively large. Should we place relatively weight on them? Absolute. Yes and no. Um, I like to use it, Mike, as a visual snapshot. So, like, if I see, you know, Right now, it's, you know, the, the, the market is, there's no volume. So we're not really getting a good, a good uh, reading. But if you see um, all the stocks green across the board, uh, you know, the, the three hours, the one hour and the eight hour, it tells you buying's been, ha depending on what time you're looking at it, you know, if you're looking at it at 
nine o'clock, nine thirty, the market's opening. And that's giving you from the European open, European lunch period, and our pre-open. Um, and there's just a lot that can tell you. I I wouldn't try to uh, overanalyze it using the numbers. Use the colors. Mike says, wonder about what when they're changing on across different time frames yeah so what happens is if you if you have like uh i don't have one right now to show you but if you have a red uh green and red that you know uh that's telling you uh, one thing it's all red it's telling you something else so once you get familiar with it and what you should do is when you get the different for uh, the different colors pull it up on a chart and you'll see the patterns are going to match. A lot of times you'll see a double bottom or a double top. You know where, where you'll get um, green, red, green. Well, it, it started positive during, and that's why they're set like this. It started positive bullish during uh, the London session. Then during lunch, uh, it you know it started coming down. And then it picked up again right before our open. That tells me one thing. But when you get bullish across the board, that means that that line. See what these what trade desks do when they start building positions for the portfolio manager or the fund. They're given a certain size, and they get paid how well price you know the prices they do they get. So they'll start buying in the morning you know and and they got an allotment and a lot of them stop and they wait to see well let's see if prices continue or not and if there's no volume prices start to come back down you know um then they start buying more at a cheaper price but when you're seeing bullish prices at the beginning and then lunchtime there's it, it keeps going up and up these guys have an allotment it doesn't matter price they got to finish with a certain with their allotment in play and so they'll buy it up and that's Vince you remember that we used to trade that way back in the 90s late 90s a lot especially back then the bond market would close at three o'clock yeah. But I'll be covering some of that, Mike, going forward. I've covered it in the past, but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing a lot more of these, get you guys up to speed. I can't give you too much information. I've been told to keep it into uh, 45 minutes, and I've already surpassed. <laughs> All right, guys. If there's no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and close up the room. Um, I'll send you a recording. And if you have any questions come up. Now, for those that jumped into tonight's webinar and you're not in the room, get in the room. It's simple. Uh, you go to the tradingroom.com. The tradingroom.com. And you fill out a free trial. We used to do two weeks, now we only do a week. And I think next week we're gonna start charging uh, for a for a uh, trial, a one week trial. We're busy, we're trying to keep up. We got a lot of traders coming back into the markets. So we've been staying busy guys. All right, but there's no more questions. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Cassie. Nick. Max, Roger. We'll see you all tomorrow morning. Bye now.